Uh, so hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Marco, and I curated this first series of dialogues here at the AA. Uh, the aim was to bring people who practice on the edges between different fields um, and in unconventional ways uh, and learn from them. Uh, we have so far had uh, S. Devlin, stage set designer, artist, Tim Kashanibar, and Ursula Meyer. Um, and next week, we will have a postponed event with photographer uh, and sociologist Charlie Kuhas. Um, anyway, today's event uh, was supposed to be uh, a kind of conclusion, if there wasn't for the postponement, um, where we get closer to architecture than in any other of the events, uh, talking about collaboration with a member of uh, Assemble who have been perhaps unintentionally uh, pulled into the art world by receiving Turner Prize in 2015. Uh, so we welcome Jane Hall from Assemble, who will be talking to AA's own uh, Summer Islam, if I can say that still. Um, Assemble are a collective who practice on boundaries of design, art, and architecture. Uh, they're well known for their participatory approach, and Jane is uh, one of their founding partner, uh, sorry, members. Uh, she studied architecture at Cambridge and RCA, where she's currently uh, a PhD candidate, looking at work of Lena Bobardi and Alison and Peter Smithson in the context of modern art movement uh, on two sides of the Atlantic. Uh, her work on public space, occupation, and collective action action in Brazil was widely published. Uh, Summer is an associate at 6A Architects. Uh, she graduated from the AA and was on the AA Council. Uh, she also teaches MA in Architecture at London Met. Uh, she directed AA Visiting School in Jeddah in Saudi Arabia, uh, and she undertook a research into the work of Aino and uh, Alvaralto, uh, which she presented at the Royal Academy last year. Um, so again, very warm welcome, uh, and I hand over to Summer and Jane. Hi everyone, good evening, and um, thank you for coming. Um, we're going to talk through Assemble's work, um, about five projects using the s photographs of construction sites as being something that Jane thinks is emblematic of the way the practice is run and how they organise themselves, sometimes very well and sometimes <laughs> um, in a more chaotic manner. And I think the kind of underpinning thread of the conversation is collaboration, which is the title of the, of the talk, but also I'm quite interested in authorship and the way that Assemble projects themselves as one individual group and whether to each individual member authorship is something that is important to them. And I think we're going to talk about that through each of the projects. Starting with Cinerolium, which is the first project they worked on before they were really called Assemble. Um, yeah. yeah. How old were you when you started this one? Um, so we began in 2010 when we just finished at Cambridge. And so we must have been 22-ish. Um, uh, there are like 20 of us, so that's kind of quite a range of ages. Um, and I suppose I'm sort of starting with this image because for us, the construction site really sort of underpins how we understand the way that we work together. So the reference here is the like Amish barn raising where everyone comes together as a community um, and building things together is part of acting out the sort of um, being part of and making the community. Um, there's another assembly member who, who tried to stop me from using this image. Yeah. Health and safety. Yeah, health and safety gone crazy. <laughs> but like we've been using this image for like four years. So I found it quite interesting that, you know, he thought suddenly we had to kind of appear maybe a little bit more professional than we <laughs> secretly are. Um, and so what you're gonna see is a range of um, construction sites that range in formality. Yes. Don't report us to anyone if you see anything uh, you shouldn't. Um, so yeah, the Cinerolium um, was our first project, which um, I c like cannot stress how informal this thing was. Um, I wouldn't even like credit it, credit it to Assemble. It really was a kind of group of people who were just sort of um, quite frustrated uh, with uh, coming straight out of education into practice and took the opportunity to um, acquire a site uh, which we turned into this, which many of you may know because we've been showing this project a lot for a <laughs> long time. Um, and the kind of thing about this project is that it's really made from a kind of real economy of means, very little in way of money or material. Um, and so the focus became about really kind of um, learning about how to construct details which could 
sort of be symbolic of going to the cinema, mm. um, even though the whole thing could have sort of like fallen apart. Um, and the, the whole thing was kind of fabricated kind of within the site itself. Um, I kind of show the curtain here because I made the curtain. Um, and it's three kilometers of, of sewing. And there's this kind of real moment of um, people homing in on particular expertise, which is basically how we welcome people to our construction sites. It's about giving people something, a kind of sense of ownership. Um, and everyone in that image is in the symbols. Everyone in this image is an assemble. Mm. There's only three people in this image who are an assemble. Yeah. Also, Samara Scott is the one with the blonde hair, so we had, you know, one in artist kind of. <laughs> I like this one. Anyway. Um, but how did you form out of this as a group, actually? So the, the people in assemble are basically the people who turned up the most. Okay. And so the more you're on site, the more present you are, the more you have authorship over the project because you've experienced the problems, finding the solutions to them, and you've acquired a kind of skill set. Um, and I think over the process of, it must have been about a month we were building this every day, um, you know, really learning exactly how to rig a curtain. We engaged the help of Flint's theatrical chandlers who came on site and like showed us how to do it all. Um, and then it becomes a point where you know there's only actually like three people who really know how to do it and like loads of other people who will help um and so the kind of transformation from the sort of taking this tyvek like roof material to um something that was rigged and pulled up and down during the film itself um was kind of the way of encouraging people to stay with us but our other tactic was uh assembly lines and so really simple a uh, set of drawings would produce about how to make a chair and you just like join the assembly line and become like really good at one thing. Mm. Um, but a lot of stuff was just like things that were found on site. So a lot of MDF was there and we kind of just sort of made weird things like vacuum formers. So there's also like opportunity for people to kind of be really experimental and try things out. So who were the people that turned up? Like, what was the social engagement aspect of this project? Um, friends, mostly. Yeah. Uh, this guy on the left, Henry, is a really good artist. And I actually have no idea who the person on the right is. Uh, never be to be seen again. But this project kind of spread by word of mouth, but also people just walking past the site. We are so visible on site. And also being in the centre of Clerkenwell, you have... Um, you know, kind of everyone going to work every day. I mean, like, oh, what's going on here? Um, so for our first two projects, it became really about um, visibility. Um, and so, but, yeah. sorry, I yeah, just want to ask. On. So you're, you're perceived as being like quite social, like participatory, like really socially engaged. Yeah. Yeah, this project was high. by you, for you, because yeah. you wanted to get some, something out of your systems over like a summer holiday when you'd realized that being in practice was a lot less engaging than you'd expected. Yeah, so I think that's something I always say about this project is like the worst, the worst moment of it was when we opened it. Yeah. It was like really fun until people started coming to it and like ruining it. Yeah. Um, you know, it's kind of amazing seeing it all working and also this kind of weird thing that everyone thought we were some sort of like professional outfit. You know, they're like, why is the film not starting? Like, there's no toilet paper. <laughs> so, well, no one thought to buy the toilet yeah. paper. Um, but then for us, there was a sort of maybe kind of um, as, you know, kind of testing out what we were actually like interested in in our practice. So the kind of whole thing about the Cinerolium was that you can be like inside the cinema, completely oblivious to the outside world, even though there's like a really like thin curtain acting as the barrier. And then we would pull up the curtain at the end of the night and you're suddenly thrown back onto the street and the kind of passers-by then look at all of the kind of audience members and it's a sort of reversal of the spectacle. Um, and being able to kind of see how something we'd built had that kind of effect was um, a kind of a nice outcome, I think, um, for us. You get quite yeah. a lot of flack in the press sometimes. <laughs> I mean, I think it works great, but sometimes. <laughs> um, and I, you said to me the other day that Cinerolium was criticised because you basically were a bunch of architects who all came from Cambridge. You know. So is there a thing in your work where you feel like being sort of privileged middle-class architects who come from a certain background makes it difficult for you to put work out there? I said difficult, you said problematic. Um, yeah. Without feeling like it's being perceived... Um, 
as indulgent? Um, I felt with this project, uh, it was a real surprise how people projected what they thought we were trying to achieve with it. And it was in 2010 at the moment of sort of lots of uh, rhetoric around big society and this idea that local cinema was closing down and that ours was basically a demonstration of the fact that if a community has to, it will build its own. Right, okay. Um, which, you know, in a way, I felt like they'd sort of overestimated us a little bit. Like, uh, this thing was kind of ready to fall apart. But... Um, I think it also, that we've always had this kind of um, assumption made about how we've put together projects or how they've come, or that we've worked for free or mm. kind of all of these things. And I think it's quite a simple, um, a simple narrative uh, that I think a lot of us have been willing to kind of engage with because, and that's why I prefer the word problematic mm. because whilst I sort of recognise the sort of imbalance in the kind of economics of it, um, and that we come from a sort of very like educated, essentially privileged group. Um, for us, it really felt like quite a grassroots um, kind of thing. And we weren't, you know, desperately trying to engage an outside yeah. um, group. And I suppose what's interesting is that our project that followed, The Folly, we were like, oh yeah, fuck, we'll, we're going to go and like engage some people then because yeah. you think we can and we don't see a problem with it. So yeah. The Folly really did become this like, community centre almost mm. for, for a kind of um, for a group. So I think we've always positioned ourselves in being quite happy to kind of engage with the, the trouble and the okay. contradictions right. inherent within it. But um, the, the vision that came out of this, though. The vision. The vision is Yard House. Yard House. Yeah. Yard House. So um, I suppose the Stinerolian was really about something that was quite spontaneous. Like, there was, there was literally no plan yeah. for how this thing was going to come together. Um, but I, what we all really enjoyed about it, and I suppose why I, I think the, the actual opening was the biggest failure, was um, the process of making it was the kind of super inspiring thing. Yeah. Um, but so also you, because you're not so interested in the built outcome as you are in the... Um, yeah, I think it depends in the project, but I think the built outcome is very much underpinned by how it's been produced yeah um but that's so, not how it's perceived so this is really interesting yeah. example of this because you've probably seen yard house we'll, we'll get have, I mean, do you yeah. have the elevation image yeah <laughs> but it's but basically people <laughs> yard house is a project where i think people know it people associate it with assemble and it's been kind of the image of it's been mm -hmm. disseminated through instagram in a way that you know that is so much more important really than the process of it's making or it's become more important than the process of it's yeah. making yeah i suppose the the kind of, I feel like our projects are really good symbols yeah. and they're kind of good images of, an, of a kind of um, uh, an idea uh, in a, as a way to like sell it. Yeah. So and I, I will show, um, you know, Yard House has become this kind of amazing bit of attraction for architecture students from everywhere. But actually what's behind Yard House, um, and I suppose Yard House itself, and the images that I always show is kind of um, represented by that little red pitch roof thing. But behind the idea for Yard House is this kind of massive place where everybody um, is filled, not just with our studio, but with other artists, makers, carpenters, ceramicists, you name it, all working autonomously, but creating a kind of community um, that supports each other. Um, and so actually this is our old studios in Bromley by Bow um, and so Yard House is the thing on the left and Sugar House is the thing on the right um, and we really tried to create in this space um, a kind of, we call this front of house which allows us to make, to continue to make things at one to one um, in the way that we were doing at Cinerolium. Um and so be able to test things. And so we built Yard House ourselves, which was a huge timber structure. Um, that's the image. Yeah, this is the image. <laughs> there it is. Um, and so the idea being is that it's like super lean, really cheap. Um, it's got no foundations, just went up, but that all of the kind of time and effort went into creating this facade, uh, which kind of then gave something back and tried to create a public area in, what was a pretty grim yard. Yeah. Um, but then we engaged the help of the carpenters. We had a studio, so they did the whole staircase. Um, 
And then this is James from Assemble uh, trying out some metal work. Um, and so it was a sort of real collaboration. And then the people who ended up using Yard House inhabited it and kind of built the spaces to suit their own needs. Um, and you sort of moved Yard House now to your new, your new offices. No, Yard House is in storage. We sold it. Yeah. Um, but, you, but the way that you, you current, currently inhabit Sugar House so, is the yeah. same. You have your joiners, you have metal workers, you have lots of craftspeople around you that you can basically pick and choose from and yeah, collaborate exactly. with at will. So Bermondsey Sugar House, which is our, our new studio, is basically like a uh, kind of yard house and sugar house amalgamated into something like bigger and better. Um, and it's a sort of synthesis of all of them under one roof rather than... We didn't have a studio in this building. This was just all other artists. So everyone had to kind of go outside and mm. um, meet each other. But this is the, the Instagram sensation that it... Yeah. I heard it's also an iPhone cover now in China. Oh, my God, it's so hard to yeah. keep track of these things. <laughs> yeah, yeah, someone made leggings with this print on it. The same you didn't get copyright, that would have been quite good. Yeah, yeah so I think we have to start making our own. Yeah. <laughs> Coming soon. Um, so this is kind of how we formalised the way we worked from the Cinerolium mm. into kind of our now everyday practice. Um, and I think the Cinerolium for us was about trying to acquire these skills and through the process of doing it, realizing actually there are some really incredible people out there who already have these skills and know how to do things much better. And all we need to do is like create a kind of space where we can cross over and interact with them. Um, and, oh right, yeah. The Bridge to this playground, the yeah. Playground. So the Bridge to this playground, I find really interesting because I didn't know very much about it and you'll have to explain, I think, the context of it. But you described to me, this is the first time that you were basically told you were artists mm -hmm. by the RABA, and it, that had a consequent effect on how you were able to um, fit the space out, how people could use it. But being told you were artists meant that actually, instead of being architects, you were able to do more with the space. Um, we'll talk through like the safety, <laughs> the safety <laughs> of the playgrounds. But issue. you know, if you were architects, you had to have your you know 100 mil spacings for a balustrade. But as an art piece, it was totally fine that a child could um, fall off the top because you know, it was, this, yeah. <laughs> because it was a piece of art. But that's a, you know the idea that you're now you're shifting your label because you weren't really architects to begin with. Or I think that you, not, there's yeah. a kind of discomfort you have if I say uh, that you're architects. You kind of like oh no no actually we're not we're not allowed mm -hmm. to say that. There's only there's only two of us, or sometimes we're part-time architects, mm -hmm. and actually we're artists. But this is kind of like label-shifting territory, which I think, I think is quite interesting. Um, yeah, so this is the kind of thing that architects could build <laughs> in the 1970s. Yeah. So this is um, Churchill Gardens in Pimlico, um, built as part of the Abercrombie Estate, which was the biggest... The Abercrombie Plan, which was the biggest um, single... Thing built as part of that plan and you can kind of see this sort of like Scandi townscape modernism going on in the background but it took them 20 years to realize this project so the playground was kind of built towards the end when things had changed um, so we proposed a project to the RIBA to build in their gallery space at Portland Place full-size replicas of these um, kind of play structures of which none exist anymore um, so when you kind of compare this to what is built today in modern playgrounds, um, you kind of realise how far, or I suppose how much we've regressed in terms of our notions of what play even means. Um, because here it's very much about kind of experimentation, um, learning through play, how to use your body, how to interact with the built environment around you. Um, and um, this, this one's still standing actually but is unusable um, at the Balfour Tower um, and so our proposition was to build these using the few drawings we could find and old photographs um, and build them all out of foam um, so it's kind of like a little bit of a joke this thing kind of looks like concrete but it's made out of this super cheap brightly coloured foam um, and actually interesting like playground rules in the UK are just guidelines Mm. It's not actually the law to enforce any of them, um, which I think... But that's not the same in the art gallery, know. though. Like, well, so in the art gallery, it was just like... I think also you show people pictures of what you're going to... Actually, every time we've built this, we've done it 
five times now we've had to send someone down to site because like the gallery manager will phone halfway through the build and be like is this what it's supposed to look like like are they actually this big um and the kind of idea here was that at full size these things start to like crash into the ceiling or um they don't quite fit and especially at the riba where they've got this light well which they usually close for exhibitions um suddenly you were kind of up in this tower mm. touching things that like children especially are told like not to touch yeah. um and the art gallery suddenly became a really kind of permissive space for us uh and as you say this kind of inhabiting this role as an artist was sort of something that we hadn't realized we could take advantage for because you were trying to assert yourselves as architects at this point at the beginning, we were like submitting them drawings and like doing fee proposals, and then we sort of realised that like the way to um, the way the RIBA at that point were trying to engage us was actually they literally used kept saying we were artists, mm. um, and whilst that means they'd like try and screw you over on the you're fee, paid less, you're if paid you're an less artist as well, artist. which is the primary underlying yeah. reason. <laughs> but you can then start insisting on things yeah. that like I probably wouldn't. Um, if I kind of approached it more as an architect. So at the RIBA, they wanted to put foam all the way around the inside of this structure. Um, and we built, so this is another one that we built entirely at our studio. Um, you have assembled builders as well as assembler. You have a contracting yeah. team. Yeah, we have a separate company, Assemble yeah. Builders. Um, so we, we, we actually did this one as assembled, but yeah, lots mm. of our construction projects now are done through a kind of subsidiary um, company. Um, and uh, so the whole thing was sort of built in situ using this one's going on that's made out of steel, a lot of contact adhesive um, all night. But then the sort of kind of yeah, idea, yeah, to create this like super immersive environment. Um, so in that one, that's at Park Hill. Yeah, this is Park Hill. And you've got, yeah. you've got foam on the bottom rungs, so they were fine with the gaps. Yeah, there they, was one a really good one with a slide and they put a pad underneath it. Do you have yeah, that image? Yeah. 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 Um, <laughs> Slide, <laughs> slide through all the slides yeah. and it looked really great. Uh, but this was also a collaboration with Simon Terrell, the artist. So there's also this thing within Assemble when we are kind of like working all together, but then also explicitly working with someone else who yeah. themselves have a separate identity as a maker or an artist. Um, and Simon really worked on the film, but it's now become a kind of, uh, yeah, much more sort of weird relationship. Um, yeah, so, I mean, I don't know how far you can Tiny, see. Yeah. The bottom of the slide here, there's, like, they insisted on putting this, like, pad of foam, and it's just, like, I <laughs> don't want to point out to you that the entire floor is made of foam. Um, so it's kind of really interesting to see how people have received yeah. this project and then the kind of battles you choose. You know, how far are you going to insist that, like, they can't put foam on the floor for the kind of sake of the, the project? Um... You credited Simon, which is because mm -hmm. you collaborated with him. But do you feel like this is like one of your projects? I'm always curious about how the way you. you so there's a big group of you, and then you, you know, three of you work on a project, and then so you are happy to present this project presumably because it's one that you worked on. But people are you're there's 15 of you, and you're speaking all the time. As far as I can gather, Assemble is constantly <laughs> lecturing. You're like on a on an annual tour that just never ends, and I don't think that. You know, you all speak differently about the work, and mm -hmm. this is one of your projects. Do you watch how each of you presents Assemble? Like, have you seen Adam Willis talking about what Assemble is compared to how Giles talks about it? Or? Yeah, no, it's funny. I mean, I'm definitely probably the only one who ever shows this project ever because um, this was my project, although, you know, it kind of got seen by and like lots of people in the construction photos are from Assemble, but they just helped out with that bit. Um, actually, for this talk, I like looked at loads of talks of like other people in Assemble. Are they good? <laughs> <laughs> I have my favourites, but you know, there's this like amazing one of Joe describing us as the Wu Tang Clan with like complete seriousness. He even made diagrams, and it's kind of it's like it's kind of very strange um, to see that, and it is strange seeing people describing projects that maybe they've had, you, you understand what their relationship with the project has been. So then when they present it back, it's this kind of strange world that, or like perspective, I suppose. But you don't have a party um, line. Like you don't have a, you know, when we talk about this project, this is how we do it, you know, and you're not gonna go and correct somebody's approach to it. Because you have a website, so you have one output where 
it's yeah. uniform. And then but you're... this is why our website's got nothing on it. Right. This is like this is why it's so bloody minimal because it's just like you can't agree. We can't agree. Right. Yeah. Um, and for some reason, we think that, that our website like represents us in so, as some sort of totality. When actually, obviously, like you know, James is currently in Dorset giving a talk. I'm here giving a talk. Like we're everywhere talking. Yeah. So. Um, I think there is this sort of interesting thing about authorship and control, which we don't have in the projects, but we do have with our identity. Because um, you haven't got a manifesto, and you've never made a book. So how do you define yourselves, if you all define yourselves differently? I think like each person has their little mini manifesto going on. Right, okay. But then I suppose to have a manifesto, you have to sort of like have something you're against, and in Assemble, we really began it as a sort of platform for us to kind of find out what we were into. Um, so you've got this sort of like weird thing of suddenly realizing that it could be your full-time practice um, and have much more opportunity if we sort of all invested in it while sort of, sort of kind of, you know, at the same time being like, <laughs> who am I? Um, but that's why doing the work is so interesting because you see different people really like creating their own niches within Assemble. Yeah. Um, so, so are there more of you that identify directly as artists if we shift to the, to like, what, you, you got the Turner Prize. Yeah. What? You're architects and now you're artists and suddenly there's some, are there some of you that take that role more naturally and gravitate towards those projects? Um, I think there are some people in Assemble who are very uncomfortable with the term architect because they didn't train as right. architects and they will always say it almost apologetically, like a talk like this, be like, you know, I'm not an architect. I don't think any of us would introduce ourselves explicitly as artists. Okay. Um, but then none of us would as architects either because that's illegal. I think there's like, kind of, like a way, <laughs> it's, like, yeah, it's illegal, illegal, but everyone does it. You know, you, I think there's a kind of a British like apologeticness about the way that you all um, won't label anything. You, know, you won't describe anything with any... F yeah. We aren't architects, we aren't artists. I'm really sorry, we didn't nominate ourselves the Turner Prize. We really didn't mean to win it. It wasn't our intention. <laughs> like, <laughs> we didn't mean to win I know, it. but no one nominates themselves for the Turner Prize. It's actually yeah, impossible. Exactly. I didn't know this until I asked you, how does it happen? But, you know. Yeah, I think it's funny because I, I think the one thing we do have is like a like, sense of responsibility to each other. Um, and because the work has been co-produced... I feel confident in saying this is a symbol project, even though like it really was mine and Joe's project. So um, in a way, like the work represents us and labels have always been like pretty uninteresting to us. Um, but everyone else is fascinated with trying to give you one. So, it's, you know. Yeah, and we kind of just like let that argument just sort of happen. But I suppose with this project, the most interesting thing was realizing how if you then do appropriate a role, you could suddenly like have more agency in a way that you hadn't. So now we like run around saying we're artists all the time <laughs> in the hope that someone will give us like a cooler space or a better gig for the for the project. Also, and I suppose we'll just like to finish Sorry, this yeah. project yeah. is a sort of creative license we started taking. So we then this was in Bath, um, where they couldn't find any brutalist programmes for us to rebuild. But the obvious connection to brutalism in Bath, especially at the university, is Alison and Peter Smithson's. Um, and there's this kind of, sort of, kind of super interesting writing around the Willie's Jeep as um, a brutalist car um, because of its sort of post-war domestication um, and uh, the materiality of it, but also because like there are lots of architect's photograph next to Willie's Jeep. So there's a great one of Le Corbusier like, doing his shoelaces up on the bonnet. So... Oh, yeah, and then also the, the, the particular one that the Smithsons owned in Blow Up is um, films going around the Economist building, um, their 1962 uh, tower in St. James. So we, you know, <laughs> just rebuilt made it. We just made, made a Jeep. Yeah. You know, so this isn't based on anything, you know, this is like pure, you know, imagination. Um, and I think when we began the project, we kept trying to find, be really rigorous about our understanding of brutalism and materiality focused solely on materiality and being trying as true as possible to the forms of the original sculptures made by these architects um, and now we've kind of like definitely gone rogue because we have inhabited this sort of idea that the Bruce's playground is very much our own kind of creative project now um, so creative license I think is the the thing the thing but then Grand B did actually happen. You won, you won the Turner Prize. So now you're, now you're artists. You know, the label's <laughs> shifted. Um, and I, I do think that you sort of apologise for it. I, I find that really 
quite funny. For, for winning the tennis. Yeah, it's like I'm you know, it's really sorry. Like it wasn't it wasn't our, our plan. And then you talk about that being the sense of responsibility towards the people that actually did it. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, if anyone like wants to trip up to Liverpool, it is sort of really amazing. Um, you know, Granby is still looks the majority of it still looks like this. It's this kind of era of managed decline in the late nineties, um, where um, people were kind of forcibly removed from the area because they wanted to make way um, to, to kind of rebuild, and so most of these kind of houses that we were given looked kind of like this but what we discovered there was this like amazing community with such a sense of humor who you know spray painting walls kind of like taking the piss out of the local council about how this kind of destruction was being was happening um you know this is 2010 this isn't like you know, that long ago um and they planted the streets so whilst a lot of the houses um are abandoned the streets kind of full of life and so it's a sort of visible occupation of a community um and their presence and so we were invited by the community land trust and i suppose that's what sits quite uncomfortably with us at the turner prize is that people think that potentially somehow it was kind of our idea we sort of came up with the whole thing when actually we were contacted by the community land trust who basically had everything sort of set in motion and this was quite a traditional project in terms of how we went around it um, well you, they did have the project set up and the work that you did was basically classic architecture renovation yeah. refurbishment but then you you realized that that was an ordinary architecture project and that you know you invented the enrichment program so that that kind of creative shift of what could have been mm -hmm. a really noble and worthy refurbishment of some houses turned it into something else from, you know, where, where are the little details from that to where you start experimenting with the doorknobs to, like, yeah. making all the fireplaces. So they kept taking money away from us. <laughs> it was really, and they kept building things wrong. I don't have a photo of it, but in these houses, they, lots of the ceilings had fallen through. So instead of just building a flat ceiling, like a normal ceiling in the bedroom, we were like, oh, I'll just build it at a pitch and then you can like make mm. the attic space, this like new room. And these contractors who are doing work in kind just like didn't look at our drawings and just like built the ceiling. So we had to get them to take it down again. And you just suddenly realise like all of the cost that had gone into that could have been used to make, you know, these houses much more exciting or, you know, maybe there's another project in there that we couldn't do. Um, and so that's where the enrichment programme came, which was... Um, the enrichment programme. The enrichment programme. <laughs> okay. Sounds really bad, doesn't yeah, it? A little bit. <laughs> to enrich the houses. Yeah. Uh, so everyone in Assemble, like, took a thing. Yeah. Door handles, lampshades doorknobs these are the mantelpieces we made so we kind of started by fabricating them along with i think this is will shannon the artist who kind of got quite involved um making these cast terrazzo uh, mantelpieces and then moving to site so the back of one of the houses like the yard itself became a kind of site of making um and then storing them in the houses uh which eventually then got um installed in mm -hmm. people's houses um, and the idea of the enrichment program I suppose was the kind of impetus to uh, create what we ended up making for the Turner Prize. Did they all get installed like 20 of you making doorknobs and like what, what, what was the failed experiment actually I never thought to ask you. Um, some people's things were better than others. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. the mantelpieces yeah. made it, the doorknobs made it the handles were amazing, but they got too complicated. My With the little ones that were made, made in the barbecue? No, 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 no. These were these, like, cool metal things. <laughs> um, no, the, bar so the barbecue ones um, made it. Yeah, my lampshades did not make it. Um, I'd say the Turner Prize was a kind of showroom for these products. Um, and I think it had kind of a lot of worthiness at the time. It was like, there was a lot of, like, William Morris being thrown around. Right. And... Um, in a way, it was like complete naivety, you know, like the night before the opening of the exhibition where we were going to launch Granby Workshop as this kind of thing in Liverpool which would be making and selling these products. We're like sitting there typing into the catalogue, like how much should we sell this for? You know, it's just like complete 
had no idea how to run a business, but the Turner Prize had sort of, within two months, like forced us to, to do that. Um, and so since then, we've very much focused on um, ceramic products. So these images I find really interesting. So the, first, <laughs> the one on the left, the blue one, that's just the one that somebody went rogue and made. That's Lewis gone rogue. Yeah. That's okay. for the Turner Prize. Okay. So that was the first image. Yeah. And then you sort of went all sales catalog and kind of refined it into something, well, into something different at the end with the yeah. aluminium foil. And we, yeah. it, in the course of our like, kind of conversations, like prepping for this, I have, a, I have an interest in the fact that you think you haven't got an aesthetic, that Assemble doesn't have a look. And then I look at these images and I look at the work we've looked at and the work we're going to look at. And I think mm -hmm. it's very distinct and it's really clear. And it's also a thing about claiming ownership and authorship where you're kind of always stepping back and forth from what isn't isn't yours. So Louis made that. So that wasn't Yeah, you, although I realised this last one, like Lewis just had a kid when he made this last image. So I don't good. know how much sleepless nights have to <laughs> He wasn't with the this. one like, you know, <laughs> rollering on the paper um, in the background. Yeah, and it's funny because I suppose it was when you were sort of asking me about this and suddenly I hadn't, I'd completely forgotten about the tinfoil crazy one. And so suddenly putting them, to, this is the first time I put all three of them together. Um, and in a way, I think this sort of, it's kind of funny because I think this is very much autonomously Lewis's work because he is running Granby Workshop so a lot of the kind of output is his but at the same time all of the products that are depicted and like their character comes from a group effort of making back at our studio that yeah. we kind of went through over a couple of years so I find the kind of question of aesthetics like quite <coughs> difficult to answer um, because so much of it is born out of the process and when you're so much in the process, yeah. sort of don't concentrate on what it kind of looks like at the end. Um, it's nice because the way that you practice the collaboration is all acknowledged. And like a lot of the modernist architects I've been looking at recently, mm -hmm. and it's something you have to assert. Like we saw Madelon recent up winning uh, an award for the Jane Drew Award for Women in Architecture the other day. And she, had to, she was talking about how um, her original paintings were always misattributed mm -hmm. once she did it for Delirious New York to someone else kind of continually in her entire life she's been finding misattributions in print um, mm. and the way that you work is so egalitarian that almost no one claims authorship and yet I think there's a line where you want yeah. it until someone criticises the look and we're going to talk about Seven <laughs> Sisters at which point you all get very defensive I think even though you're not individually responsible you, you recognise that you were there, you let it, you know, yeah. you saw what happened. We're, part of the we're process. super anti, we're super into supporting individuals to have authorship over their projects, but we're really anti that then becoming something that's like public or recorded anywhere. Yeah. Or and there's no name to who was working on the doorknobs or who, you know, there, there's no name to the Brutalist Playground. No, And exactly. that's important. Yeah, but then it does become, you know, like there's only two people in Assemble who could have produced those doorknobs in its first instance. Like, you can read... Because of your skill set. Yeah, exactly, yeah, because right. of skill sets. But then you, you kind of learn through observation of everyone making stuff around you. Yeah. Um, you definitely see the certain people recurring in the photographs, like with a hammer, and certain people you never see in a Some photograph. people are much more hands-on, yeah. other people like, have different skills elsewhere. And I think increasingly we are creating like pockets of, of expertise where people really like following their personal interests. Yeah. Um, and the work, I suppose, will come out of a mixture of it being those people, but also the, their engagement um, yeah. with it. Ah, okay, wait, 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 this is, yes. Um, this is what I should have had rolling in the background. <laughs> that conversation. Anyway, it's fine, it's okay. Um, so, this is just the process of making. This is like super, this is like super early on. This is like in the run up. This is in the, this is like when we're working out what to do for the Turner Prize. So you had to invent new work we to invented display. We everything, yeah. So what had you produced when you got, when you won it? When you were nominated, sorry. Well, so we didn't have this, we were nominated for one project and we presented a different one. Right. So we actually, we tricked them. Nice. <laughs> yeah. Um, we thought it would be better to invest the money that they give you. They give you as much money <laughs> for winning as they do for putting on the exhibition. Right. Um, and so we thought that money would be better spent trying to kind of uh, begin something new rather than just sort of doing a kind of weird representation of something we'd never even questioned before. You know, the Turner Prize was really through the whole project into a whole new light. It's kind of, we're sort of standing there suddenly looking at it from the outside being like, oh, is that how you see these houses in right. Liverpool, like literally 
people going up to the street, knocking on doors, being like, is this one the art? You know, is this one the art? Is this one the art? Yeah. We'll let them in. <laughs> yeah, this is the art. <laughs> but they weren't even finished as well. Right, so we were yeah. also nominated for something we hadn't actually done. It was something we said we were going to do, but... <laughs> um, mm. Which I suppose is also why it's kind of a little bit like, oh, it's not So really... it basically gave you like a creative burst to produce all this stuff. Yeah. <sighs> My it's skills cool. are not in a... PDF embedding. In PDF embedding. So this is the, oh, this is the barbecue with the doorknobs, which is quite a famous um, story. So this is how the doorknobs are made, which is ceramic, uh, slip cast ceramic um, slip put into then, then uh, fired in a barbecue where you put in like banana skins and glue. And the whole idea was all these products could be made like in a house. <laughs> or outside the house. <laughs> or in an abandoned street is mm. probably more um and so it kind of, and then makes this this was the this is the sort of kitsch photographs i was talking oh, about said, where's the hand well so i thought the one with the baked beans was more fun oh, I see. Okay. but there are ones with hands as well <laughs> okay um, this is like Assemble Gone Rogue again, so this is work this that, you is, know... You yeah, can... exactly, that's what I mean. Yeah, when we were talking about aesthetics, this was some other kind of world that uh, I wasn't aware of. Um, yeah. And I suppose this project for us has become about ceramics. Um, and so now all we do all day is invest in ceramics. Um, and the idea of Granby is that everything is a handmade process, but because it is a workshop that also has to have a kind of economic um, sustainability for the area, it has to be able to be scaled up. And so we started using a RAM press, uh, which is kind of industrial um, industrial press for, for it kind of, well, you'll see it squishes things basically. Right. Um, so do you have a separate business now? So you're like, you know, you're basically a multinational. You've got your <laughs> yeah, we've got we've got <laughs> uh, yeah, we've got three. You've businesses. got assemble, you've got assemble builders, and you have Granby Workshop, Granby which Workshop. basically sells your ceramics. These things. Yeah, so, so there's a lot of fluidity between Granby Workshop and Assemble, um, but anything to do with ceramics kind of goes their way. Uh, um, but this was actually a project we did in Milan last year for Mini, where they paid for the machine, mm. basically. Yeah. <laughs> He's a loose one. That is the gratification yeah. of um, doing ceramics. Is this, this worked really well earlier in my Do you have a film of the PlayStation as well? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. We'll, we'll get into that one. Yeah, stop. Um, <laughs> so we're using this machine, the RAM press, to make um, loads of plates. Um, in Liverpool this is splatware this is splatware you can buy online <laughs> you can, can you? yes you can, you can yeah. <laughs> I've seen <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, so yeah so it's interesting so, so, so the, the press was bought through an Assemble project but we've given it to Granby Workshop so Assemble were employed to to do a project where we were able to persuade the client that what we really needed was like a massive machine mm. um but obviously Assemble don't need a massive RAM press, <laughs> but Grammy Workshop really do. So we often kind of adopt different identities within our own companies in order to kind of do different bits of work. Um, more ceramics. PlayStation. So PlayStation, this is really interesting. So this project in Seven Sisters, I don't know if anyone has been or goes past Seven Sisters tube station. Do you have a shot of the front? <laughs> later on, later on. Yes. So I think this is really interesting about a kind of follow-on conversation about your aesthetic and acknowledging that there is a kind of clear, linear, graphic narrative as well as there is like a process narrative. Uh -huh. um, and this project attracted so much vitriol online that I just find it quite funny. Um, but there's a disease there's a design post when this, this project came out and the comments about what the building looked like was so aggressive and so unpleasant that it became entirely about what it looked like and there was no acknowledgement really of how you perceive the work which is that it was a really refined clear process yeah. and a development from well you work with an artist you work with Matt Raw to produce this and actually this is this is a peak pinnacle of perfection in terms of like how you can work with pressing clay together and how the whole process you know was basically super refined yeah so I think I think earlier when I see like those three images from the Tenor Prize of the sort of like Assemble Gone Rogue making different <laughs> things is 
kind of this idea of like a commitment to a process. And in a way, um, having seen um, having seen how this I sort of start in the middle, um, how this project was put together, um, and all the iterations we went through, and also working with another artist, you suddenly sort of start to appreciate how this project is a kind of product of like hybridity of two different people's working methods coming together, their different kind of tastes, um, but also just understanding what's going to be best for an outdoor project in terms of like the material, the colors, using different clays that can work with different pigments that can be glazed in the right way. You know, suddenly it restricts you that you sort of don't have this sort of like palette that you could do anything. Mm. Um, and mm. so we had this going on every day in our studio for like six months or something, you know, two complete outside artists, um, tile makers coming, having lunch with us every day, being part of the group, making like thousands of tiles. We rented a kiln. Um, and so seeing the whole thing produced and the iterations they went through and the sort of different decisions they made, um, you know, every one of us can kind of see where this sort of vision in yellow and green comes from. <laughs> but obviously if it's just like landed mm. in your neighborhood um, and it's not to your taste, it probably is quite um, offensive. But I think that's really good because in a way, um, because we're so focused on how something is produced and being really hands-on with it, I think we're much more confident in taking risks and not being as kind of apologetic for for this project. I think this project is really great. Yeah. But who is it on DZ who hates? I mean, this, this one guy. I'm, not, I'm one actually guy. I'm actually not going to read them out because they're really quite abusive. Okay. I mean, this guy Agdipa. Like every time anyone commented anything vaguely <laughs> offensive, he added to you know his his additional comment on it. You've not made it unless you've got some trolls. <laughs> I mean, he's proper trolling. Like it's really it's really offensive. But and it didn't hurt. Now. So. I don't know. Oh, Go on. <laughs> okay, fine. This is Agdipa's first comment. It started the whole, the whole feed, yeah. I had the misfortune to walk past this site every day and it looks absolutely ghastly. I can't imagine anyone having such bad taste and judgment that they designed this. It'd be best to tear it down and throw away these revolting tiles. I am very disappointed by this complete mess. So that started it and then it just kept going. Yeah. Uh, it didn't hurt anyone's feelings. You, you all just like, oh no, it's about the process. So it's, We all laughed yeah. about it. But so this project's really Matt's project. He's in the blue jacket on the left. And I think he might have felt slightly uh, like responsible, maybe. Um, but also like none of us care um, at all. And then actually I looked through all of our Instagram comments mm -hmm. and they're all lovely. So, right, on the same project. Yeah. Okay. So just, you know, it's I just know, I know Dezine's quite bad, yeah. but like, just don't read the scene ever. <laughs> They're also, Quotes. somebody on the yeah. scene also like really did not like our approach to health and safety from that. Um, what, the, the yard house, the yard house image? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So there's boring people on DZ. Yeah. We'll see how they like Goldsmiths. Yeah, so this is a, this is a real building. building. Yeah, yeah. So, hey, real building. Real building, yeah. <laughs> Conventional real building. So this you won through a competition. This is like a classically yeah. procured project. Well, so this one's quite interesting because actually it started in, we won it in 2014. So it's kind of really spanned like pre, pre Turner Prize and post Turner yeah. Prize. That's um, quite early in there. In that the just reminded me, we used to have a WhatsApp group, which was pre TP <clears throat> and then it was like <laughs> before and after. So it did, there was, like that was a real pivot and, and, and Goldsmiths is probably our only project bar a couple of Jameses, which have lasted like forever. Mm. Um, and this was the one and only competition we'd ever done. Okay. Um, and it was to refit Goldsmiths University, have this old swimming pool and um, it's got these kind of water tanks um, there. And it used to look like this and now it's full of artist studios um, for their MA students. And they wanted to leave this like that, but transform the kind of bit with the water tanks and the kind of rest of the building, including this front bit, which is like an awful shed, into something that all the students could, the students could use, but also become a kind of public, um, publicly accessible kind of space for art in South London. Um, and so this is like the opening of the MA um, show 
uh, and hopefully sometime later this year they'll be able to kind of do that bit here. Is that how it looked when you won the competition? This is our competition entry. Yeah. Kind of. This is our change, but yes. Okay. Um, and so, you know, the idea is to create this huge window at the front, which kind of creates a sort of transparency through the gallery and connection to this public space, um, which we now realise they might not actually, there's like actually building right in front of that, so it could be like a real disaster. But, um, you know, this was something that we like super heavily invested in because at the time we hadn't really had our, an opportunity as a group to kind of stretch our legs at a building. Everything was kind of the scale of the Cinerolium or kind of small bit of public space. So were any of you furniture. architects at this point? Uh, nope. No. Are any of you yet? When you are you training to, to be architects? Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I think we're going to be five by the end of this year. Right, okay. Um, and this sort of gent kind of classic procurement process of like winning a competition and um, then going into a conventional building where a client has a brief. How did that affect your general approach to feeling the need to enrich things? <laughs> um, so this project's run exactly the same as any other project that we have in the office. Like two people look after it and then people get pulled on to like... And you have design reviews as well. Like you're all like we have design reviews, gentlemen. but this one has had quite different ones. This one's been... Usually we use design reviews as a way to um, talk about specific uh kind of choices in a project whereas this one's been much more about how to deal with a problem with a cl with the client right okay um and you know get co collectively sourcing um opinion because in a way the design actually hasn't changed very much it was about inserting these two kind of white cube elements followed by um carving out kind of space from the original building um and we kind of worked originally through like you know sort of 1 to 20 models this is a more recent image. Um, and then sort of larger scale ones on the left, but then kind of on site today, how it's kind of looking. Um, and I suppose the sort of like approach we have taken, which might be a bit mad, is trying to, <laughs> we are delivering the entire facade. Um, assemble builders. Assem assemble. Okay. Assemble, yeah. are delivering the entire facade. So um, you're manufacturing the pieces of the facade yourselves in the office? So we developed the whole thing. Um, it, it is this, uh, it's being, so we did all the sort of staining tests for it, um, working out all the special details that would have to be fabricated, which you can kind of see in plaster, which are bits that aren't kind of off the rack pieces. Um, and then working the proportions out and how to put it together um, in our studio. Um, and so making this kind of one-to-one -one mock up um, and this was very much done for us rather than for the to tell it to the client or anything it was like you know us kind of like working it through rather than drawings um, and you're still delivering that package yeah but that's the only one that you're making yourselves now so everything else is you've got a contractor yeah you have exactly. a builder you tell them what to do and then you hope that they do it yeah. the way you want and they don't do it the way you want. <laughs> um, so this is the hole in the ground. Um, and then this is the kind of big central space, um, which is kind of happening. Um, and then all the kind of like weird bits of this project. It's like a real puzzle, yeah. sort of different like pieces. Yeah. Um, and so what we've ended up doing now, the kind of most, like we keep going on little, like day trips to this project. It's become annually our Christmas outing. Um, so we kind of all go down and, uh, but these are, these are other people, not us digging, digging holes. Um, Does that feel like disempowering having someone else <laughs> doing that? You're, you're at a scale now where you can't, you, you literally can't do this work. Um, yeah, this, this is a kind of scale. Yeah, this is, yeah, we literally, yeah, we literally can't do this work. Yeah. <laughs> you're correct. Um, yeah, and then the tanks, which are going to kind of be this amazing um, space that's sort of just like left almost how, they, how they've always been. Would you do it again, working with a contractor? Is that the kind of work that Assemble wants to pursue now? Um, I think like actually like a lot of our work is done um, through contractors. I think we have this tendency, this like drive to want to deliver something ourselves. And in a way, it's a real kind of investment that having Sugar House is such an amazing um, uh, bit of infrastructure for us because 
it's also kind of mad to personally invest in that way or, or as a company invest and like trying to deliver something just for the sake of wanting to make yeah. a piece of it. Um, but I think we all support it as something that we're all quite happy to sink some money into. Um, How will that work project. with you? So I, I know that you had a project that was um, in New Orleans, which is more of a master planning project. Mm -hmm. How is that going to work when you start? To, your, your role gets so much more kind of separated from literally being on the ground and being involved. Is that work that you actually want as a group? Or are you going to be able to pursue that and be fulfilled from it? Or actually, is it the small scale things where you can be in yeah. the begin to end process where you that you that you personally want or you know, yeah. that as a group you want? I think it's actually like a really individual thing. Like we take on each project because there's some element of like interest in it. And like this one in New Orleans just had like a really crazy client, a really cool brief, seemed really like open to how we wanted to work. And that's like very attractive for a couple of people. I'm like not touching that project with a barge pole. Okay. Um, but you know, then there are other things that kind of really attract and sort of interest me. And I suppose the idea is that people have the sort of freedom um, to kind of pursue those. But, the, you know, there is always this question, like, is it an assemble project? Um, How do you decide it's what to like do? It's like an existential <laughs> question. Like, you all vote, though. It's like a veto, veto rights on a project. Um, we do have veto rights, but you wouldn't... It would be bad form, I think, to okay. exercise your veto on a project, <laughs> especially if you've got a project coming up. Right, okay, that you want, yeah. yeah exactly. Okay. Like, diplomacy at like, a very high level. Um, and like financially, how's this working out? This kind of like picking and choosing of stuff. The two of you want to do it, but one of them, that project's a research project, this project's a real building. Mm -hmm. How do you kind of make that work for all of you that's, that's fair when you're working on work that brings in fee differently? Um, so we also collectively review all of that sort of stuff. So projects won't get taken on if, as a group, we don't think it's going to be financially sustainable or or we would like collectively look at how it could become <laughs> financially sustainable or like how we might need to change it or approach it in a different way. Um, but essentially, if there's a couple of people who want to do it and it looks like it's going to work out, then it, it goes ahead. Okay. Um, so I think that's why we've had like a really weird contradictory mix of clients. Like, you know, someone was just like ethically against working for freeze. But then we had like all these projects with BMW at one point, and it was just like, <laughs> where are they on the website? In the They're room, not on the website. You know? the BMW projects. That's, that's been so buried. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so you know, a lot of assembles direction is just based on like who is in the room um, to make the decision. Okay. So it can change. So um, what's the most exciting thing that happened to assemble in the last year? <laughs> <laughs> financially related question. Yeah. Like, well, so yeah, I I don't know. I was thinking about whether to say this one <laughs> well so for, so for me actually like weirdly we had so much like freedom and experimentation when we were like beginning that suddenly we realized that if we want to create this as something that to, to, to do forever and the infrastructure is really important so the most exciting things happened to us is getting we're all paid equally now um we used to be based just on the work you did and the projects you were running you got each project you know individually stood up by itself um, but that created, weirdly, a lot of like unequal, kind of quite, uh, the difference was um, quite quite big within the group. So, so now we just have a flat rate for everybody, which also then allows everyone to start working on each other's projects and doing stuff that doesn't have any fee and like, it's really fun. <laughs> it's really good. <laughs> Yeah. Um, it's like boring, slightly more conventional though. Like, you know. Yeah, no, it's funny <laughs> that we're getting really conventional. Yeah. I think the idea of like institutionalizing ourselves is yeah. quite interesting. Um, and then how much we start like believing what other people say about us. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's why we're going away this weekend. So oh yeah, you have a summit coming up. To thrash it out. Yeah, yeah our annual summit. Okay. Um, yeah. Great. Um, I think we're going to wrap up. We can open up to questions, yeah. Excellent. So I'd like to start, but maybe I'd like to ask Summer actually, because Summer comes from 6 as I said at the beginning, and you guys do a lot of collaborative work as well, and you, you are architect, you know, clearly you're well, an architect, so. and you collaborate with a lot of artists. You, like, I presumably the, the work that you do with artists is seen as collaborative. And I want to ask, what is it maybe that you learned from this exercise that you went through with Jane and maybe how you would compare um, 
either the freedom that they have uh, to um, uh, your level of freedom mm. or uh, generally how would you compare the two situations? Um, I mean, I ha the, one of the projects I'm working on at the office is a theoretical collaboration with an artist, but we haven't begun, begun it yet, so I can't compare how, how we would approach it. But I, I, I expect it to be different because I think when you work uh, for a practice, and you take on the kind of identity of it, which you uh, enjoy in lots of ways. But a lot of it is something that's particularly for six. Say, I joined the practice; it was already pre-existing, so it had an identity. You know, we have a party line, I think. You know, and it's one that I buy into. But it's a party line that, <laughs> if I was to talk about our work, I'm fairly sure I would talk about it in a way that I think would be representative of of us, not my perception of it necessarily. And I wouldn't, you know. So that's why I find it so interesting that Assemble is constantly speaking about Assemble and no one's really, no one really minds what, well, you know, Jane doesn't mind what someone else is saying. I hadn't seen any of the videos. I watched videos of other people in Assemble talking about themselves because I was curious about the disparity. Whereas, you know, if I was to speak of 6A, I think it would be in a way that was representative of how Tom or Steph or Owen and John might want 6A to be representative. I think that's really interesting because I, I think people put a lot of pressure or understand the idea of kind of identity or freedom within what they're doing based on the output. And actually what's been like amazing for us is we've got two people in Assemble. One's our finance guy and the other one's our office manager, neither of whom, you know, like were there at the beginning. And like we had this real worry about like how would they fit in, like will they represent us? And now we've like our finance guy is designing a club. <laughs> yeah. He's designing. He's doing like, talks, no? Like, yeah. He's doing your talks. Your accountant like, speaks for you. You know, yeah. like, yeah. I don't. All he's doing, really, is, <laughs> is the books. But I'd still be like, hey, Karen, what do you think of this drawing? Or like, and actually, I think a lot of the kind of idea of a party line or an identity is born out of just spending every day with somebody mm. rather than what something like, you know, what you're known for being really good at or whatever. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's a question. Um, hi. Uh, given the age we live in, uh, do you set yourselves any kind of environmental remit in your projects? Um, only in that something, when something seems like a bad idea, we consider that kind of thing. But I think what's been really um, the, the sort of big question when we began was all about kind of reuse. And we are really interested in materials. That's really where our focus in terms of you know, kind of that sort of thing is. And, you know, we've done projects where, um, and I think it's a really popular thing, especially within architectural education, is the idea of, of reuse of materials. And we did this amazing project for Robin Day's um, daughter, an exhibition of his work, and we used huge timber columns. And, like, the engineers were like, you know, we thought we'd cut them in a certain way that they could be reused by somebody. And the engineers were like, it would be better if you just went and burnt the whole thing because like the cost and the storage and the moving it around. Which, and so I think um, for us, we're really interested in kind of actually working out the kind of how all these things kind of operate. Um, but it's not, I think, one of our sort of leading uh, interests. So you don't actively um, sort of project that as a dimension of your work? No, I mean, I mean but as you say it, it's obvious, and it's obviously very interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it yeah. wouldn't be obvious to me if I hadn't asked that question. Yeah, as I mean, equally, we don't, as individuals, project this sort of social agenda thing, which I think is something that's been projected onto us because of a lot of um, our projects. I think that's why um, we partly don't have any one thing or pursue specific kind of manifestos or interests because there are 20 people. Um, so. Um, you potentially would just get a very different answer if you had someone else um, sitting here from the group who might approach a project from that point of view. But usually so much of that sort of thing for us is about whether it makes sense, um, rather than just kind of assuming the sort of normative good of something that's environmental or social. And that's what we find like exciting, is like the challenge and the question of it. Um, yeah. More questions? Behind you. Oh, yeah. Um, I noticed that you use a lot of pastel colors. Can you give them like? 
Uh, I just wanted to ask about your use of color because I noticed that you use a lot of pastels and sort of um, primary adjacent tones. And I wondered if there was a conscious sort of philosophy behind your color theory or if it's kind of sprung up that way because certain people direct the same projects or there's a kind of continuity there. Um, so a lot of stuff is just the colour of the product. Like we usually work with kind of existing things or usually trying to use um, kind of maybe products that have been made for one thing and then used for another. So for example, the Brutus Playground foam is just like the colour that the manufacturers make it in and the colour denotes how dense it is. So it's not for us, a, you know, that if it was a different colour, we would have just like used that. So maybe it's some form of a question of industrial uh, manufacturers are really into pastel colours. Right. <laughs> we just get the, the brunt of it. Um, but I suppose it's sort of tying into the kind of aesthetic question that we uh, haven't really reflected on. But I mean, you know, Seven Sisters is a little bolder than that, and I don't think Goldsmiths is going to have much pastel in it, but uh, yeah, maybe we are attracted to pastel tones. Any more questions? No. I think we're done. Well, Summer and Jane will stick around for a drink so you can all, you're all welcome to come and talk to them. Um, AA Bookshop is set up over there with the 6A and Assemble book, so you're welcome to go and purchase them. Um, but yes, thank you very much. That was amazing. Thank you. Thank you.